Thank you, everyone. It's lovely to be here, uh, particularly in this session. I've found it extremely stimulating and very interesting, a lot of the results that people are getting at the moment. And I'm um, looking forward to putting it all together at the end of the day. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. It's a story about a project that I have been more recent, that I've more recently designed and why I think it's important. So <clears throat> in sum, I think this project will contribute to fundamental issues surrounding the, the nature of humanity's experience, an understanding of their surroundings and the things they made and in connection with these things. I want to see really if the values were shared uh, between previous and current cultures in different regions across Europe. And that's the emphasis that I'm looking at is values and, in a sense, intangible culture. What intangible things are people sharing? And the link I'm making with that, of course, is uh, standing stones and megaliths. So this project will begin to address what I think is a fundamental issue in archaeology that was raised some time ago by Richard Bradley, actually. And that's namely to understand how ancient peoples perceived and altered their landscape and how this might allow us to reconstruct their worldviews. This project focuses on a period of intensive monument building in prehistoric Germany, about uh, 3,600 to 1,200 BC, and in Scotland, about 3,000 to 900 BC. And I, as I said earlier, I'm focusing on standing stones. It will compare how humans chose and made places that were important to them, and using evidence really from case study archaeological excavation, GIS, which I won't be talking about uh, the former, the excavation, in detail here. I want to look at um, and to discover whether the reasons behind re erecting the Meniers were really um, the same both in Germany and Scotland, or whether there was some other uh, driving force there. So, and if there was a different kind of driving force, what these differences might have been. It's really in this way, I feel, that we can begin to determine to what degree peoples across the seas shared the same belief systems as well as their architectural choices. So, what can we um, already state, I think, is that while standing stone monuments often appear very simple, their cultural significance is very clear, for they altered the natural places more enduringly than earthen or wooden monuments that appeared shortly before, <coughs> and in fact concurrently. And with these new constructions, they continued for more than 2,000 years in both Germany and Scotland, from about 3,000 uh, BC to 900 BC in Scotland, and uh, Germany, as I said earlier, was uh, more... Uh, about 1,200. There are some possible uh, hiatuses in Scotland. Significantly, they were constructed over a far longer time frame than any other megalithic monument type in these two places, highlighting their continual relevance for Neolithic and Bronze Age cultures. And by the time, really, of the late Neolithic, they were a megalithic monument that had become essentially a fully exposed monument. Despite this longevity and clear social relevance for prehistoric Germany and Scotland, comparatively little work has focused on the hundreds of extant prehistoric standing stone rows, pairs, or on their own, those simple, what I think of as simpler monuments. This is actually a stone row. That's a representation thereof as the other two stones have fallen. So even though in more recent years there has been quite a reasonable amount of work and discussion on Scottish stone circles, especially the larger circles, the recumbents, uh, recumbent stone circles and other encircling monuments um, around uh, Cairns, compared to the number that exist, the work that is um, really work is done by very few people and they concentrate on very few monuments and they tend to like the complex monuments, you know, that's a bit sexy. But this little one standing on its own somewhere, you know, that doesn't seem to have the, uh, the draw for a lot of researchers. So in Germany, standing stone considerations are often also sublimated by research done on other monuments. For example, tombs. One here. I have one here. Exceptions to this have been the production of detailed gazetteers, both in Britain and Germany, usually by Grote and Böll in particular. Of these three gazetteers, uh, Böll and Kirchner offer... Um, I've written Kirchner here. Uh, sorry, Bell and Grote offer really detailed considerations. And Kirchner, which I haven't written down here, in 1955 actually did a detailed research project and interpretive work on the genre of standing stones in Germany. And uh, however, his was the last work, 1955. 
And so to have a last type work for such a long time ago, I think clearly exemplifies the gap and the need for further work in this area. So whilst these comments highlight the gaps in the relative regions, and more importantly for this project, um, I think there's really uh, been a lack in, of comparison between the use of standing stones between countries. And here, of course, I'm um, using as an exemplar Britain and Germany. Traditionally, Scotland is most often compared with other Western European cultures along the Atlantic coast due to the latter's striking standing stone monuments or innumerable circles such as Ireland, Brittany and so on. But more importantly, um, I feel that um, they have also have a sharing of the way they've adopted, in a sense, farming practices. Uh, not so much Ireland, but I'm thinking of Scotland and Northwestern continent, where they often had quite a focus on herding and pottery, but maybe not intensive agriculture initially. I really feel that it's uh, gone unheralded that by 3000 BC, both Germany and Scotland were constructing simple standing stone monuments that were often also associated with the dead, and there were th thousands of them. We're going back to that one. Here we are. <coughs> so here we have representations of uh, particular cairns or mounds, uh, burial mounds, with standing stones on them. You also get standing stones next to cairns. Um, it's quite common too that you will actually, uh, particularly in Scotland, I haven't heard of any emphasis of this in Germany yet, and I hope to find out if we can prove this to be the case is that in the stone sockets of the standing stones in Scotland, they actually put partial cremation remains in there, along with uh, lovely crystal stones. I find that quite fascinating. So the main differences between the two places being is that there's no confirmed Neolithic or Bronze Age stone circles at the moment in central or northern Germany. There's some debate over that, but people like Johannes Müller would say categor categorically those circle-like objects are not stone circles, they're they uh, really are combined with graves or other, <clears throat> other forms of megalithic monuments. The other thing too is that um, Germany has uh, decorated veneers and in Scotland uh, at this state, in an, if you were thinking about anthropomorphic stones, we haven't yet identified any anthropomorphic stones in Scotland or the British Isles. Right, so why were these distant regions choosing to erect similar standing stones? Um, they were often even worked into the same shapes. So let's just have a look at a few of those. Okay. I think really that they may well have been sharing some kind of understandings and really significances, and we want to find out what, what they are. Are these shared significances possible evidence of concurrent shared values, or are they a delayed aggregation with some reformulation by the indigenous populations, for example, in Scotland? Does Scotland, in fact, have direct connections with Germany at this time, or were the adoptions funneled through other cultures like Ireland? These are important notions to understand, I think, if we are to come to any understanding of life ways and values involved and melded across a greater Europe. Notions that are most relevant, I think, Kirchner states that in his interpretive considerations that the phenomena of the monolithic monuments <clears throat> is, a, is really coherent across ancient Europe. And he feels that there's no question about the, um, that it's somehow an originally uniform basic idea that people shared at this time. But is it possible that this idea changes in the course of time, for example? They're still erecting monuments, but is there different reasons across time or places for what they mean and why they're using them? Basically, I would like to test these ideas by comparing sites in Saxony-Anhalt and the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Um, I really want to see what's going in, on in these two regions, as you can see here. So the dots up here, these are the sites actually I've already considered in my project in Scotland, about 125 sites, and now with um, uh, the project expanding on Mom with Vincent Mom, who's in the audience, we're doing more work in here, so there's many more points in this area now. The sites here um, in Saxony Anhalt, uh, it seems like there are very, very many, and I thought, yes, that's fantastic, I'm going to have this massive database. But in fact, there are only 15 that are in situ, for sure. 
So that's why, in fact, I've chosen the Isle of Skye then to compare it with, because they're about exactly the same number, 15, that we know of there. So, <clears throat> in the work done to date in the fields of standing stones, both in Germany and Scotland, there's absolutely a clear lack of reference to the greater landscape or the application of GIS tools, looking at simpler monuments only. In the past 24 years, perhaps apart from myself, there's not been a single significant study using these approaches as a major basis of the work in these regions in connection to standing stones. There is now then, I think, an opportunity to use geospatial technology to uncover relevant information about the location and use of standing stones in both these places and to carry out some sound uh, comparative analyses. Essentially, the study upholds that these places in the form of standing stones really represent landmarks for people in the past. And something that is attached to them is the information about the landscape in which they're in as the people of the time saw it. Specifically, what is missing in past studies then are investigations that can use standing stones for what we might call landscape perception studies. These informative landscape and social markers add a cognitive perspective to the study of monuments that were possibly originally deemed to be permanent markers of landscape understanding. In a sense then, they are actually realisations of shared cognitions in the past and participate in collective engagement. So what I'm quickly going to go through with you now is what I've actually found in Scotland today. Already two minutes, and we are racing through. <laughs> OK. So firstly, in, in Scotland, we basically looked at the orientation of the monuments using statistical analysis. And we found that the uh, groups through here have very similar orientations towards the sun at the summer solstice. But the most, most popular one is the moon at its most northern rising um, and southern setting points that only ever occur every 18.6 years. And these have all been supported statistically, so it's not like airy fairy or look at that points that way, isn't that nice? Oh, maybe that one does too. We're talking now about 125 sites across this region and counting. Okay. <clears throat> the next thing we did was do 3D landscape, um, construct 3D landscapes of the entire horizon, and the horizon itself is measured every 0.01 of a degree for accuracy. So we created these 3D landscapes, and what we've plotted on there are the movements of the sun and the moon at very particular times. And what we found in this process, after looking at laying them all out on the floor, but now we've just done some statistical analysis, but that's for another talk, is that we discovered there are two landscape types. In the north, the horizon is closer than the southern, and you get two peaks, or if it's a curved mountain, in this area. The summer solstice sun, for example, rises out of the closest northern horizon that's the most dominant in the northeast and sets in the most dominant looking horizon in the northwest. The same happens for the moon every 18.6 years. In the south, it's distant, you'll also get water. We often get two little mountains here or hills, or, but some, as often as here, we only get three sets at these, what they're called, ordinal points, southeast, southwest, and so on. And so we have this setting up pattern. We also have the reverse occurs. So here's, I'm just quickly showing you this. That's the site that I showed you on the Isle of Mull. This is a different site, completely different. They're very similar. Loch Bui. This is what I call the reverse site, the second form, which is where the southern horizon is much closer, and whilst this horizon is often are quite flat, it's closer and higher in the south overall than in the north. The water is now in the north. What also happens often in the south is you may get the curve <coughs> of the hill through here, and it will block out the entire winter sun for the day at the winter solstice. There's a lot of astronomical plays going on. That's just to give you examples of reverse sites. We call them classic sites. Keep going very fast. So here's the last thing I want to show you, and I'll give you my conclusion. <coughs> We're now putting in our, our 3D landscapes and also our 3D uh, panoramas at the standing stone sites to look for very particular things that people could see at that time, say 1500 BC at the moment, around the time that these monuments were built. Standing stones were only primarily built the simple ones between 1400 BC and 900 in Scotland, for example. So one of the things that we discover is that any of the little prominent hills are actually lit, backlit by the sun at the time of the solstice, at the rising and setting of the sun. And you'll get, if you have a full moon, the summer solstice sun 
as it is rising and forming and setting. So these are the kinds of things that they're looking at. They're all in opposition in the opposite sides of the sky. At the north, at midnight, on the summer solstice, the sun sits directly just under the horizon. So whilst we know that in a technical scientific sense, we never realise at midnight we're going to get the sun glowing across these latitudes at this time. And what is important is that now you can't see that at most sites. It's no longer there. And finally, last one is that uh, what you call the bear. You can see him there. <coughs> Earlier in the year or in the day, it comes around like this horizontally. And then at 9 p.m., it stands up vertically. And this only again happens uh, at the winter solstice. Okay, so quickly in my conclusion, because I'm already a little bit late. So these are the kinds of things I want to look at while I'm in Germany. So whilst I've done some initial studies, I find that the general sightings are looking similar. Local high ground looking over a distant view into a valley or across water, something similar. So already I've started to see that there are some similarities going on. So in conclusion, Bradley has argued that people began to build before they farmed and that such activity enabled them to alter natural places uh, much more than they had you know, hitherto done. I think that so far the project work in Scotland has shown that the reverence for the natural continues in the Bronze Age and in the Neolithic, despite the fact that there's agriculture going on, suggesting perhaps that either the actual form of reverence um, perhaps is not really uh, changing at this point. The need for interacting with the supernatural, though, has somehow intensified by the fact that they have to build standing stone monuments to show these places. Beforehand, there may, it seems there may be some uh, evidence of this in the Mesolithic without standing stones. Through this project, then, I'm really trying to discover how people in these regions of Saxony-Anhalt and the Isle of Skye use stone structures perhaps other material culture, and certainly the dead, I think that's a very important landscape and, and astronomy, to create places echoing their own worldview. By assembling these forms of evidence, a clearer picture will be built of the relevance of these monuments and the place they had to those who constructed them. Ultimately, it will enable a greater understanding of the possible sharing of this human history and cultural activities across time within the European context perhaps across the seas. Thanks.